Welcome to Short Cover, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for part two of a three-part read-along, four-part series as we journey through The Haunting by Shirley Jackson or The Haunting of Hill House. It depends on how you picked it up, what year your book was published. Uh, this is the read-along for chapters four and five. Uh, next week we will finish the book, and the week after that we will have a review on the text. So, right. Dalton, did you have a rundown of chapters four and five? Yeah, chapters four and five, pretty simple here. We get chapter four where the haunting really begins with Eleanor. She starts hearing screams at night, starts hearing banging around at night. We've yet to get a physical manifestation of haunting here besides just noises audible. Uh, and then chapter five, we move into that. I believe it's Theodora wakes up covered in blood. The room's soaked in blood. We get a lot of horror tropes going on there. Uh, and Eleanor finds her name written on the wall in a threatening message here right which uh, i think there's some stuff going on with that there with the naming of a character okay so we'll talk about that a little bit there uh, that's really all we've got here the hauntings have begun but nothing's uh terribly pressing at this point everybody's still having a great time a very victorian time you know let's have brandy and play croquet and ignore everything that's happening we'll sit around and tell ghost stories and be frightened until it's time for bed absolutely right. absolutely but it's still a great vacation so right uh anywhere you'd like to start with this um did you have a definitive starting point I, th the first part i have to talk about is eleanor not wanting to go into the library okay i actually i think i got a little bit on the library and that is interesting uh the library itself seems to be, I think it's the first cold spot that they encounter, isn't it? I think it's the first definitive cold. There okay. was a stream of cold air yes. at some point, but now we've got the library, which they think is definitely cold. Yeah, it's a cold spot, which is a part of paranormal. And, and it smells. Yes, it has an earth tone to it, uh, which uh, I put on here makes it feel very much like a tomb when you get that cold, earthy smell. Or my basement, both yeah. terrifying. Uh, but the idea of cold spots in paranormal fiction, paranormal investigation, whatever, uh, would denote that there is some kind of supernatural presence there. Uh, and to have a building, or a room in a building that is specifically cold and smells like it's underground is very off-putting. Uh, it gives the idea maybe a decomposition, maybe a tomb, maybe a basement. Something's not right with the library. The cold is certainly not why Eleanor doesn't want to go there. Okay. The earthy smell she seems to not like, but is not overpowering. Okay. Do you know why she doesn't want to go there? Why doesn't she want to go there? That's where we think a suicide happened. Okay. Right? Uh, that yes. is where the, the young helper had okay. hung herself. Um, this is something which would be incredibly off-putting to someone who has thoughts that are self-harming. Okay. We have been exposed to many a thought from Eleanor that she is an idiot, that she is worthless. They are making fun of her. They are going to leave her, right? Okay. This is a very self-hating individual. Okay. Uh, I believe there was a scene here, and a, I, at one point, Eleanor is leaning over a railing, looking up. I, she's even pulled back, because not only is she having these like self-doubting thoughts, but everyone else is having thoughts about her as well. And perhaps that's the house playing on to the mystery of what's going on here. Uh, or everybody else is starting to get this vibe from Eleanor as well. That creepy, something's not right feeling. Well, do we have any real indicator that anyone feels that way about her? Not that I'd say specifically. But Eleanor sure seems to, yes. to think that they do, doesn't okay. she? A little bit of paranoia, maybe? Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll so, hold on to that for you. Uh, okay, um... Interesting points there, and if we want to start talking about the house a little well, uh, Dr. Montague has started to prop open doors for us as well, because they felt very uncomfortable with doors being closed behind them, being locked into a room. Uh, so we started with, you know, the propping open of the doors, of course they shut, now we're going to keep them open. I think he even said he was going to order door stops at one point or right. something like that. Uh, well, that was the first read along. That was, was that the first one? That was the first okay, part, well, pretty sure. Um, and he's started propping them open with things. Yes, but they close. They still close. And then the Dudleys began to close them as well, keeping things shut in. Do we ever see a Dudley close them? No, but it's implied that Very it must have been the Dudleys closing them. I'm going to have to teach her her place, Okay, Dr. Montague says. Uh, at one point, I believe he says he even he's going to nail these doors open if he has to. Right. So, uh, we, we do get the 
beginnings of some supernatural things going on here. But easily explained. Could have been the help. They could have been closing those damn doors. Yeah, there's not much there's not much that cannot be easily explained here, is there? Nah. Okay. What what would not be able to be easily explained? Um the extremely cold temperatures? Well, that could that be the, that could be that explained. The thermometer does not pick up on, and that seems to be a thing with uh, horror fiction, supernatural fiction. There's all you can't explain it. It's always fine. Everything's fine. It's just something's off. It's fine until I, it isn't. I think that's the that's something prominent in good horror fiction and good okay. horror films. Okay. Um, a lot of the a lot of the ghost stories you have these days are way over the edge. I think. And right. You, you, there's no reason for doubt. Okay. Now we're talking a little bit about the house here. Did you have some more in the library before I just talk about the house in general? No. no you're okay. Fine. Uh, we're talking a little bit about the house. It is mentioned that this is similar to the Winchester Mystery House, uh, which was uh, I think we agreed was inherited by Sarah Winchester, built by the Winchester family. Yes. And uh, if my memory serves me right on this, this is a house that was built by someone who was a, a little mil- mentally unstable. And believed that she was attempting to fool the spirits of the house by building weird things. Rooms that lead to nowhere, stairs that lead to nowhere. I don't think that's... The, don't think that's That it. might be a legend about the And house. it could be the lore that's come from it. The legend I heard about the house. Okay. This is the Winchester family. Okay. Of Winchester rifle fame. Yes. Um, the story that I heard about the house, uh, which is invoked in the text. That's why we're Absolutely having the conversation. So. Um, Mon- Dr. Montague says, you know... This place is haunted, this place is haunted, and the Winchester house, and now we've got this. And the Winchester house was, I believe, inherited by Sarah, the daughter of the man in the Winchester rifle uh, uh, company. Okay. And Native Americans, it is rumored, put a hex on her. Okay. A curse on her because the Winchester rifles killed so many Native Americans. Okay. That... And this is the lore that I've heard of the house. And she believed if she ever stopped building... The Native Americans put a hex on her the minute she stopped spending the fortune that she inherited... Okay. ...from all these Native Americans' deaths. The minute she stopped spending that fortune was going to be the day that she died. Um, so, in that house, there are maze-like structures. Yes. There are steps which go up to the ceiling. Yeah, lead to nowhere. There are doors that open to the wall behind it. Yeah, and there are a lot of similarities going on here with Hill House and the Winchester House. But ironically, from, from what I understand, the first day that they stopped doing something to that house was the day she died. There was some, some I, I don't remember what it was, they stopped work for, for XYZ, I don't remember okay. why. Uh, I do think that's good by Shirley Jackson, though, is including that. Right. That is blending fantasy with realism, because the Winchester Mystery House is a thing. It is a physical place you can go visit. And putting that in here makes this feel real. It gives. You, it also gives you a sense of... Uh, it gets your bearings here. It gives you an idea of what the house is, what it's going on here. So I, I, I like it. But I think it, it's a, get a good inclusion. Also what it does... Many people know, anyone who was reading this when it was published would have known about the Winchester House, right? Okay. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Fair. Um, So anyone who would have been reading a horror novel at the time this was published would have been familiar with that. So simply by mentioning it, the back of your brain would have been haunting with that hex, right? Okay. So we've got many things that come up through this text. Even these little quotes that she keeps quoting literature, we know that's from somewhere. Okay. The back of our brain knows exactly where it's from, and it pulls that up, right? We get the drinking of the stars like Darl in in, um, As I Lay Dying. So we get this little inference that Eleanor is less than stable. Okay. And we don't know why we feel that way, but it's back there, and we feel that way. Right? So all these little all these little references that she keeps pulling up, all of these old fashioned wives' tales that she pulls up, all of these good old boy phrases that get thrown around, they've got some darker subtext to them. Okay. So we've got all of these things just simmering, roiling in the back of our brains. And we get unnerved, but yes. we don't know why. Yes. Uh, and this is something that I really wanted to bring up. I was hoping maybe every now and then when you read something, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't sit right. And you know there's something there. And it pisses me off when I can't put my finger on it. Sure. 
So naturally, I'm like, Adrian, please go do the work for me and tell me <laughs> what I am missing in this here. We got uh, I am inherently untrusting of the character of Theodora. Okay. And I feel like I might be putting all my eggs in one basket with her, but there's something not right about her. Theodora is very much the Dalton of this text, I think. Okay. A maybe that's why. I, character. Maybe that's why I don't like very, her. Uh, very Epicurean. Okay. Uh, wants the pleasure of things, doesn't want to have to do the work for things. Okay. It, it seems like normally when something is happening in this text, Theodora is around, or Theodora is mentioned, or where is Theodora? Something doesn't fit with her. And I would like to point out that these hauntings are only affecting the women at this point. Luke and Dr. Montague have not been involved in a lot of these. Well, we've got two things to look at there. One, Luke is a liar. Okay. Luke leaves the room. Every time one of these things happens. But I feel like I should be mistrusting Luke because of that, which makes me feel like he's fine. Right, but... So so there's the thing with Luke, or, or with Theodora, we don't trust Theodora. Well, shouldn't she not trust Luke? Two, the hauntings are only happening to the women. A, that's a, there's a bit of a misnomer there. The direct okay. hauntings are happening to them. Yes. But B, those are the two that are there because they have... a. Uh, dereliction towards the supernatural. The doctor has never okay. been haunted, and Luke is just an, a member of the family. Okay. So it's the it's the women of this group that are predisposed to these happenings. And there is the bit of a stereotype that uh, women are historically more attuned to things like this, more attuned to the supernatural. Just like there's the stereotype that black people are more attuned to, yeah. to things like this. And the Dudleys are very in tune with the house. Yes. Right. Uh, so there could be a little bit of play there. But anyway, Theodora at one point, uh, they enter a room and she begins to dance with one of the statues. And that's it, man. She does it, it's weird, and everybody's like, all right, moving on. I'm so glad you brought that up because, A, obviously that, that, that little moment stands out. Yes. B... I found out something very compelling about that moment Okay. by studying something else that I was looking up for this. This is what I was looking for, because something in that moment is there. There is something I just can't put my finger on as to why the hell it's there, and I need it. Well, first off, um, we make a big point every time we catch something that has been put into um, pop culture from a text, right? Yes. Um, the Cabin in the Woods, directed okay. by Joss Whedon. Great movie. There's a moment in that where the hot blonde in the group um, starts dancing with a moose head above it's a, wolf. a fire. It is a wolf, wolf head, head yes. ab above the fireplace. I think that is a direct reference to this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's happened someplace else. Maybe it just feels very no like it though, because as soon as she's done dancing, everybody just kind of blank stares, like, cool. "Okay, moving yeah, on." Right. Okay. Um, plus, Theodora is very much the character, like the hot blonde, right? Uh, Theodora's not a hot blonde, but she is uh, an indulgent type character. Okay. But I was looking into the Hill House as Labyrinth. Okay. And I was just getting in, so I wanted to know what's going on there, because it's sort of a labyrinth, right? It's, a, it's not quite maze-like. It's David sort of Bowie's a always going to show up eventually. Yeah. Um, as in all good horror novels, right? Fair. But you get this idea of the labyrinth, and... It struck me because they can find their way around, but it's difficult. It's not a maze because it's haunted. Like the right. Minotaur haunts the labyrinth. Okay. Um, built by Daedalus, house the Minotaur. But what really gets interesting with this scene is the tale of Ariadne. Oh, I, I am clueless at this point. So please fill me in. Um, so, and I am not the most well-versed on this, so it gets a little strange for me as well. A little, little out there. So, um, Ariadne and Theseus. Min, um, what was his name? Minos was t waging war on, I, I can't remember the, the, the city-states involved, but Minos was waging war. Okay. And... The city-state on which he was waging war wanted to know, what are your terms? We don't want this because they killed Minus' son or something. I don't know. You know how, how it all goes. And Minus said, okay, I've got a minotaur. You've got to sacrifice to me seven virgins and seven boys every year. And I will stop this war. 
Okay. So the other city state said, okay, fine. We're going to send you seven virgins and seven boys. And you can sacrifice them to the Minotaur. Well, to sacrifice them to the Minotaur, they put them in the labyrinth. Okay. And they have to try and find their way out. Well, the Minotaur kills them, right? Kills them and eats them. Fair. It's dark in there. As the Minotaur Minotaurs knows do. where he's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the other civilization, the other city-state, got tired of it. And they sent Theseus, who was a strong young man bound to be a hero. Okay. And to kill the Minotaur, he was going to be one of those sacrifices. He'd go in and he'd kill the son of a bitch, right? So, Ariadne was the goddess, the mistress of the labyrinth. Okay. She sees Theseus and immediately falls in love, like you do with a hero. Okay. So she gives Theseus, I believe she gives him his sword, and she gives him his roll of yarn. You know this part. Yes. He, take, he leaves the yarn in so he can find his way back out. Um, fine and dandy, right? That's the labyrinth. He kills the Minotaur, yada, yada, yada. But what's interesting, as I was reading about the labyrinth, is that now the labyrinth of which Ariadne was the mistress okay. is not supposed to be just the maze-like structure. So when these seven boys and seven girls showed up to be sacrificed, there was a ceremonial dance first. Okay. So there would be a ceremonial dance... And then these seven boys and seven girls would be sacrificed. Dance before sacrifice, it turns out, is not an unusual idea. All right. Um, so the indigenous American sun dance ceremony is one example. There's a sacrifice with the sun dance. The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. Okay. You know that? I haven't read it, but... Um, it is a... Uh, what is it? Uh, dance. Belly. Um, includes, obviously, dance, but also a sacrifice. So it seems innate in history, in human history, through our stories, through our literature, um, it seems innate that whenever a sacrifice is invoked, we put indulgence before it. Okay. Indulgence and dance before sacrifice. Or is it the other way? Is it that... Whenever the invocation of carnal pleasure is about, something so innocent, yet suggestive, yet sexually suggestive as dance, anytime something like that occurs, we're afraid we'll have to pay for it. Okay. Which one is it? Is it, is it the chicken or the egg? Okay. Anyway, that is Theodora dancing with the statue. Okay. Um, I'm curious to see if there's anything else that comes up later from this, and I would like to dig into this deeper because I, 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 it's a good answer. It is. It's a good explanation, especially with the idea of dance before sacrifice. But I am still just uncomfortable with it because, again, maybe this is my mistrust of Theodora, this puts her in a supernatural... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Realm? Aura. She has that supernatural aura about her. She really does. Uh, when you look at characters who are imbued with supernatural powers, the stereotypical witch of early English literature, things like that, uh, the dancing is always a thing. Dance with the devil. Uh, so it, they, there's something here. And where do we dance? Where do we dance? We dance around the cauldron. We dance around the cauldron. Where we're making a sacrifice, aren't we? The sacrifice is coming. So mm -hmm. I, I don't trust her. I don't. There's, she's got something more happening. But real quick, later on in that very same chapter, we have... Um, from Eleanor's point of view, um, they're all sitting around cracking jokes, okay. despite the fact all this stuff is going on. Uh, in my book, this is page 123. And we get, it's like waiting in the dentist office, Eleanor thought, watching them over her, watching them over her coffee cup, waiting in a dentist's office, and listening to other patients make brave jokes across the room. All of you certain to meet the dentist sooner or later. She looked up, suddenly aware of the doctor near her, and smiled uncertainly. So again, we have that little bit of carnal pleasure, the laughing, the joyous okay. occasion, the gaiety. But you still got to see the dentist. Okay. And boy, that ain't gonna be that ain't gonna be comfortable. Towards the end here, Eleanor finds her name written on the wall, and it's not that she's worried that there was a, a veiled threat. 
Uh, it's not that it was written in blood, because we get a lot of weird things with blood going on here. It's in shock. She right. is concerned that it, the house knows her name. There's a lot going on with that there, because again, looking back to this like early idea of the supernatural, things like that, uh, names are a sense of protection. You can use a name to hold power over someone. Now that the house has Eleanor's name, the house has power over her. So I, I think there's a lot going on with that there when we have the scene with uh, Theodora, before that, I believe, dancing with the statue, which seems to be invoking, if we will, this sacrifice that is coming. The house really starts to attune itself. The writing starts appearing on the wall. Things are in motion now. Well, we have a, a small passage again on 123, which blends these two things. Okay. This carnal um, desire, the indulgence, invoked and invoking a name, okay. and the uncertainty that comes with that. On 123, I am going to get fat and lazy in Hill House, Theodora went on. Her insistence on naming Hill House troubled Eleanor. It's as though, it's as though she were saying it deliberately, Eleanor thought, telling the house she knows its name, calling the house to tell it where we are. Is it bravado? Hill House, Hill House, Hill House, Theodora said softly and smiled across at Eleanor. There's a lot going on there, but like you said, three, yes. na- three times she says the name. Yes. Three times she says the name. Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, yes, Bloody Mary. absolutely. But here's, here's another thing I want to point out to you. Did you catch it? Did you catch, out, did you catch something extremely as I lay dying esque about that passage? Oh, I didn't, I didn't. Let me read it one more time. Let me read one more time and see if you catch it. I'm going to get fat and lazy in Hill House. That's the invocation of the indulgence, right? Yes. I'm going to get fat and lazy here before the sacrifice. I'm going to get la- fat and lazy in Hill House, Theodora went on. Her insistence on naming Hill House troubled Eleanor. It is as though she were saying it deliberately, Eleanor thought, telling the Hill House she knows its name, calling the house to tell it where we are. Is it bravado? Hill House, Hill House, Hill House, Theodora said softly and smiled across at Eleanor. Okay. Do you see it? Is this the uh, the speaking to the mother? Are we talking about here? What what, what, what are we... Eleanor's thinking. I don't like it when okay. Theodora. Eleanor's thinking. I don't like it when Theodora says this. And she looks over and, and says. And Theodora yeah, says. Hill House. Hill House. Hill House. Hill House. Hill House. Okay, so she's not ever. Eleanor never tells her she's uncomfortable at this. I feel like in this text, though, it is more forgivable because they are supposed to have some supernatural. Uh, sense about them. They're all gifted in some way. They've all experienced something before. So there, there's a little bit more you can play with there. Again, though, I, I inherently do not trust Theodora at this point. You have a woman who is invoking the statue, is invoking the carnal pleasure for the sacrifice. You have the woman who is, at this point, it blatantly says, invoking the house itself, as if she was like, you know, tempting doing, the fate. Tempting the fate. She knows what she's doing. Uh, there is going to ha- be something with Theodora in this, it, wholeheartedly. Or I'm going to look like an ass. I'm cool with either. Well, I think this is a very surprising text. Okay. This is a very surprising text. Okay. And that's the thing. We were talking about this just briefly before we started filming. Just, you know, our quick little quip. It's what we, what, you, what you like, what you didn't like. Uh, it goes either way. Either I'm right and I feel great about it because I picked it. Or I'm wrong and I'm surprised, which is better. Right. So it, it's a good read either around. I, I'm okay with it. But we do get a lot of tropes of horror in this. A lot of tropes of horror from past horror that's been utilized going forward from this. You have the bumps in the night. You have the writing on the wall. The naming of things. uh, We'll go with the evocation of the sacrifice. That seems to be something that's stuck around. Uh, Bloodbath. Signing books in blood. The sense of uh, happiness coupled with fear. Cold spots. Because something very interesting is happening as well. That every morning when Eleanor wakes up, it's beautiful. She slept well. Had a great night, feels at rest, feels at ease, which is strange when you're sleeping in a haunted house. Very strange. Yeah. So there's something there as well I'd like to believe. Or it's just, it's brilliantly done because I don't think I've ever seen it done in a novel. It's that sense of ease you get. You can definitely see this in film. You know, when the, the kids go away to the cabin in the woods for a while. It's that wonderful sense of relaxation, enjoyment. It puts them at ease possibly the carnal pleasure it's the build up to what's to come yeah so it's one or the other either way i like it it's a good little part that's just kind of slid in there i'm about it well an everyday now has a crescendo okay um what we're getting here is we're getting freudian transference are you familiar with the term lay it on me in freudian and 
Juan, Tiffany, feel free to strike me down if I'm doing, saying this wrong. Freudian transference is we are all sort of keeping people at arm's length until we decide we love them. Okay. Once we decide we love them, Freudian transference says, we've got them, we take whatever image it is that we have for love in our mind, and we just sort of impose it upon them. Yeah. Okay. So Theodora's model for love is her model of her mother's love to her. Okay. As transference has occurred, she is getting very close and very comfortable with Theodora. Okay. What, what are we seeing her say about Theodora at this point? I hate her. Okay. She's stupid. She's lazy. Which would She's be something indulgent. Someone I would say about her. their mother. That's that transference. Well, but that's what her mother was getting saying to her. Okay. That's why she is so self-loathing. Okay. Is because her mother had passed these ideas on to her. She knows her mother loves her. Mother loves me, but I'm lazy. But I'm stupid. So once she decides she's close enough to Theodora, remember, by the end of this, this text, by the end of these chapters, they're sleeping in the same room and wearing yes. the same clothes. They're sisters. Yes. Once she has that, um, then she gets to treat Theodora the way her mother treated her. Uh, one quick note, we don't have much time. Um, I talked a lot last time about literary references, and I forgot, yes. I forgot the big one. Lay it on me. Eleanor. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, so Luke and Eleanor uh, both mean light. Okay. Um, Montague, John Montague. John means uh, Yahweh has been gracious, apparently. And Montague means pointed hill. Okay. It is also, obviously, a literary reference. Romeo was a Montague. Okay. Um, Romeo was involved in the star-crossed fate, right? So we've got, um, in the very names here, we've got a lot going on at a meta level. We have a lot going on at the level above that. We've got a lot going on on a literary level and the meaning of the names. So th the names going deeper into the meaning of the names, they all mean something to do with God or light. Okay. Um, taking from the names, they all have literary, right? Um, Montague, uh, Luke was in... Um, one of Christ's chosen people. What were they? The disciples? Disciples, yeah. Okay. So again, we have so many things at play here that what she's doing is she's hitting that note on the piano and it's striking the chord in the back of her head. Okay. And she's just letting the song play out at this point. Okay. She's just letting these things bounce off of one another. There's a lot of stuff layered in here and we're going to continue to dig deeper into this Yes, next week. next week we will have the final part of the relong, which will be chapters 6 through 9. Um, and then the following week we will have a review of The Haunting, The Haunting of Hill House, however you found Shirley Jackson's masterpiece. If you like this sort of thing or you want to support us, hit that like button because it really helps us out. And if you have not hit that subscribe button, maybe do so. And we hope to see you next time as we go on reading The Haunting by Shirley Jackson. Three different names, but like how that went, where it started. Uh, I, I assume think with this. I think with the movie. Is the movie The Haunting based on this? Yeah. Really? With Liam Neeson. Is it any good? I have no idea. I've never seen it. I think I saw it, but I don't remember. There's probably a pretty good indication, huh? <clears throat>
Good. Yeah. Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for part two of a three-part read-along, four-part series as we journey through The Haunting or The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This was chapters four and five. Do you have a recap, Dalton? Let's restart that. Just chapters four and five? I think so, yeah. I thought we were four, five, and six. And then seven, eight, and nine. No, because I thought it was four and five. Unless our books are spread differently, mine's a nine chapter book. Yeah. But we're, I was doing it by pages. Oh, okay, so just four and five? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I go right then, I'm prepped for next week. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. I Do you know where your notes started for the